Okay, before we jump in today, just a quick but really important heads up. Everything we're discussing here is for educational and entertainment purposes. It's definitely not medical or legal advice. And remember, things like CBD, CBN, Delta 8, they can interact with medications. That's crucial. Always best to talk to your doctor or a healthcare professional first. And, you know, these statements haven't been evaluated by the FDA. All BioWellness X research and content are 100% human crafted by our dedicated team. AI is used solely for video, visuals, and narration. One more thing, a disclosure. Our sources mentioned BioWellness X. Just so you know, their products use 100% hemp derived material, fully compliant with the 2018 Farm Bill's Delta 9 THC rules. Okay, done with the formality. Welcome to Voices of BioWellness X with Daniel and Sophie. If you've ever tried uh, growing really high quality THCA flower at home, you probably know it's a field just filled with rumors, maybe some uncertainty. So today we're diving deep into the science, the actual biology of crafting, well, better buds, right in your own space. Yeah, that's exactly our mission today. We got this great stack of research, all focused on science-backed tips for home growers. And honestly, we want to cut straight through the noise, the bro science. Right. For anyone looking at their plant, thinking about producing potent cannabinoids, topines, you really need to understand one core thing. Yeah. This plant is basically a green chemical factory. A factory? I like that. And its output. It's yep. totally dependent on its environment. That's the key. Exactly. We're not really interested in anecdotes today. We're zeroing in strictly on the biological facts you need to get those really frosty, impressive results. Our sources break the whole process down into about seven core concepts, starting right at the beginning, setting up the grow room, and going all the way to that final, really crucial step, curing. Okay, so let's unpack that foundational biology first. The main idea, really, is stability. Your cannabis plants, they're constantly reading their surroundings. Light, temperature, water, nutrients, even the airflow. They're sensitive. Very. Yeah. And any major stressor, anything that throws them off balance, it triggers a defense response. And defense mode is not maximum resin production mode. You want them comfortable, focused on growth and flowering. So you kind of have to become the ultimate plant whisperer then, optimizing everything for their comfort. That's a good way to put it. And the very first essential step is just preparing the space. The sources really hammer this home. The grow room absolutely must be clean, dry, and pest-free from day one. You're basically designing a perfect little habitat. Okay, habitat design. What's critical inside that habitat? Movement. Good airflow is essential. You need oscillating fans, not just to, you know, move air around, but to actually strengthen the plant's stems and, crucially, prevent those stagnant pockets. Ah, the dead spots. Exactly. That's where mold, mildew, or pests love to set up shop. Stagnant air is, well, it's a killer for yields and quality. Got it. And environmentally, what kind of conditions are we shooting for? Think midsummer. Cannabis generally thrives between 70 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit when the lights are on. And speaking of lights, you need consistent, reliable lighting. Not just intensity, but even coverage. Make sure all those potential bud sites get the energy they need. But lights mean heat, and plants mean humidity, right? How do you manage that? Yeah, that's the challenge. If you don't manage it, that factory you're building, it's going to overheat or get too damp. So a solid exhaust system is pretty much non-negotiable. You need to constantly pull out that hot, moist air and just keep things stable. Okay, climate lockdown. But what about feeding? You can give it perfect light and air, but if it can't actually absorb the food, it doesn't matter much, does it? What's the hidden key there? Ah, uh, pH monitoring. This is critical. So many growers skip this or guess, but pH levels dictate nutrient uptake. Has Think of pH like the key that unlocks the plant's food locker. If the water or the soil is too acidic or too alkaline, the plant can be sitting in a sea of fertilizer, but literally starve. It's called nutrient lockout. It chemically cannot process what it needs. Wow. Okay. So getting the pH right unlocks most of the nutrient success. That makes sense. It's huge. All right. Let's move into tip one then. Mastering the clock. Yeah. Light cycles. It's not just about energy, is it? It sounds like it's the plant's internal calendar. Absolutely. It's the command center. During the vegetative stage, Veg, our goal is just building the biggest, strongest structure possible. Think of it as building the engine of the factory. Right. Getting a huge. Exactly. So to simulate a long, endless summer, we give it 18, maybe even 20 hours of light every day. This just fuels massive root stem and leaf development and then comes the switch this is where the biology gets really interesting triggering the buds it is fascinating to make the plant think autumn is coming which triggers flowering you have to switch the light schedule to exactly 12 hours of light followed by 12 hours of uninterrupted darkness uninterrupted is key absolutely critical 
that perfect, consistent dark period triggers the hormonal shift needed for flowering. So what happens if there are light leaks, like from equipment or under a door? That's where consistency becomes paramount. Even small light leaks during that dark period. They totally confuse the plant's hormones. It can stop flowering, slow it way down, or worse, trigger hermaphroditism, where it develops both male and female parts. Big problem. Okay, so diligence with darkness. But I know there's a shortcut for beginners, right? Autoflowers. Yeah, that's an option. Autoflowering strains are interesting. They've been bred with some cannabis ruderalis genetics, and basically they flower based on age, usually around three to four weeks after sprouting. They completely ignore the 12-12 light schedule. Easier for some setups. And regardless of the light schedule, there's tip three, which seems pretty fundamental, feminized seeds. Oh, absolutely essential for efficiency. Only female cannabis plants produce the buds we're after. Using feminized seeds gives you something like a 99% plus guarantee you'll get female plants. This saves you what headache? The huge headache of constantly scouting for male plants early on and having to pull them out before they release pollen. If they pollinate your females, your whole crop is ruined with seeds instead of high quality buds. But wait, even with feminized seeds, the sources mention you still need to be watchful. Yeah, you do. Even feminized seeds, especially if the plant gets stressed, can occasionally produce a hermaphrodite plant, and we call them hermes. They develop both male pollen sacs and female flowers. You have to spot those and remove them immediately, or they can pollinate themselves and potentially the rest of your garden. Vigilance is still key. Okay, this is already sounding like it requires some serious attention to detail. Before we get into feeding them, let's just pause on that. Managing the light timing, the climate control, ensuring the genetics are right. That takes real focus. It really does. And the quality you get in the end. It relies entirely on creating and maintaining this controlled, stress-free environment. These aren't like rugged outdoor plants fighting the elements. Think of them more like pampered factory workers that need optimal conditions to operate at peak efficiency. It makes sense. Achieving that level of control definitely takes expertise or at least a lot of careful learning. And if you want to explore premium products that come from exactly this kind of expertly grown cannabis, remember you can visit biowellnessx.com. All right, let's move on. Tip four, the nutritional shift. What are we feeding these factories? First, the mm -hmm. medium matters, right? Soil, cocoa core. Yeah, the quality of your growing medium is the foundation. Whether it's good soil or an inert base like cocoa core, the key thing our source of stress is it must drain exceptionally well. Why is drainage so important? Because, fundamentally, roots need oxygen. They respire, just like we do. If the soil is waterlogged, there's no oxygen, and the roots can't function properly to absorb nutrients. Right, oxygen for the roots. And the nutrient needs, they change dramatically depending on the stage, don't they? Big time. During that vegetative stage, remember, the plant is building all that green infrastructure, leaves, branches, so it's hungry for nitrogen. Sources often suggest something like a 3-1-2 ratio, NVK. Nitrogen is the main building block for all that tissue and chlorophyll. Makes sense. Build the factory first. But then you flip the lights to 12-12. And the plant's mission changes completely. It stops focusing on vegetative growth and pours all its energy into reproduction, which means making buds and resin. So the nutrient needs flip, too. Exactly. You have to switch to blue nutrients. These are lower in nitrogen, but higher in phosphorus P and potassium K. Maybe like a 1-3-2 ratio, give or take. Phosphorus is critical for energy transfer needed for flowering, and potassium is key for overall plant health, water regulation, things like that. Oh, and calcium becomes really important, too, for strong cell walls in those developing buds. Okay, different food for different jobs. Uh, but you know what's interesting is that the sources say the single biggest killer for new growers often isn't about getting the NPK ratio slightly wrong. Ah, uh, let me guess. Water. Bingo. Overwatering. It's like the classic beginner's mistake. You must let the top layer of soil, maybe the top inch or two, dry out between waterings. Why is overwatering so bad? If those roots sit in constantly soggy soil, oxygen gets locked out. Then you get problems like mold, fungus gnats, and worst of all, root rot. The roots turn mushy, brown, sometimes they even smell bad and they just can't sustain the plant anymore. Avoiding that is critical. So let it dry out a bit, got it. And quickly, on structure pot size matters. Oh, definitely. You don't want to put a tiny seedling in a huge 10 gallon pot right away. Start them small, maybe one or two gallons. Then as they grow, transplant them into their final larger homes, maybe five, seven, 10 gallons. Why the transplanting? If you put them in a huge pot too early, it's easy to overwater, mm -hmm. and the roots might struggle to colonize the space, 
but more importantly, if you leave them in a small pot for too long, they get root-bound. The roots just circle around and choke themselves, which severely stunts growth. Give them room to grow as they need it. Okay, that makes perfect sense. This leads us nicely into tip five, really right. dialing in that environment. We talk temps and airflow, but it's more than that, right? It's about controlling the whole system. Exactly. It's about fine-tuning. We mentioned the ideal daytime temp, 70, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. What about when the lights go off? Should it stay the same? Good question. Does it need to drop? Yeah, slight drop is actually beneficial. Ideally, you want the lights off temperature somewhere between, say, 58 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This little dip helps mimic natural conditions and can actually encourage the plant to ripen and finish its flowering cycle more effectively. Interesting. Okay, but the sources really seem to emphasize one environmental factor during flowering above almost all else, humidity. Yes. Humidity control during flowering is absolutely critical. High humidity, maybe 60-70%, is actually fine, even good during the veg stage. It helps the young plants grow. But once those dense buds start forming... You have to drop it significantly, down to maybe 40-50% relative humidity. If you let it stay high while those buds are packing on density, you're basically creating the perfect little microclimate inside the flower structure for mold and bud rot like detritus. Ugh, bud rot. Nightmare fuel for growers. Yeah. It really is. Managing humidity and ensuring you still have that excellent airflow we talked about, those are your two best defenses against losing a huge chunk of your crop right at the end. It's heartbreaking when that happens. Okay, so understanding and controlling those environmental numbers, temp, humidity, airflow, lets us move into tip six. Actually reading your plants, they talk to you, right, through their appearance. They absolutely do. You have to become a bit of a plant detective, in interpreting the visual symptoms. If the mm. plant's unhappy, it's going to show you, usually on its leaves first. Uh, let's play plant doctor. Okay. Scenario. You see yellowing, but it's mainly on the lower, older leaves. What's the likely diagnosis? Okay. Classic symptom. Nitrogen is a mobile nutrient in the plant. That means the plant can pull it from older growth to set it to the new, more important growth up top. So yellowing starting at the bottom usually points towards a nitrogen deficiency. The plant is scavenging. Got it. Okay, next one. Leaf tips are getting crispy and brown. That's usually one of two things. Either nutrient burn, you fed them too strong, too much salt, or it could be heat stress. Maybe the lights are a bit too close to the canopy. And what if the yellowing isn't the whole leaf, but it's happening between the veins, leaving the veins themselves green, like a weird pattern? Ah, that classic intervenal chlorosis. Yeah. That pattern strongly suggests a magnesium deficiency. Magnesium is key for chlorophyll production. It just shows how specific the plant's chemical language can be if you learn to read it. Fascinating. And the most common site, probably for beginners, droopy plants. Yeah, droopy always means water stress. But here's the tricky part. It could be too little water, or it could be too much water causing root problems. How do you tell the difference? Usually, if it's underwater, the pot will feel light, and the plant will perk up pretty quickly within hours after you water it. If it stays droopy even when the soil is wet, or if it droops again right after watering, you're likely looking at overwatering and potential root rot starting. Mm -hmm. You have to check the roots and mushy, brown, maybe smelly roots confirm it. Right. Okay, so learning that language is key. Now, for folks who have these basics down and want to push things, the sources mention yield optimization strategies, stuff like pruning. Yeah, once you have the environment dialed in, you can start manipulating the plant's structure for bigger yields. Techniques like pruning away lower growth that doesn't get much light, topping the main stem to encourage more side branches, and low-stress training, or LST. LST sounds gentle. What is that? It's actually a really effective technique. You gently bend and tie down the branches, training them to grow horizontally instead of straight up. Why do that? It breaks the apical dominance, the tendency for the top bud to get all the energy, and creates a more even canopy. This means more of the lower branches get direct, intense light, leading to more bud sites developing fully, which means a bigger overall harvest. Advanced growers might even use supplemental CO2 in sealed rooms, but that requires perfect control over everything else. Wow, okay. Lots of ways to maximize. But all that work leads up to the grand finale. Tip seven, harvest and cure. You could grow a masterpiece, but if you mess up this last part. It's yeah. to ruin it. Yeah, the finish is everything for quality. Harvest timing itself is crucial. It determines the peak potency and the final cannabinoid profile. How do you know when it's peak? You need a tool. Mm. A magnifying loop or a small microscope. You're not looking at the leaves or the pistils, the little hairs. You need to look at the trichomes, 
those tiny mushroom-shaped resin glands covering the buds. What are you looking for on the trichomes? You want to see them transition from clear to cloudy or milky, and then finally to amber. The ideal harvest window for most people is when they are mostly cloudy with just some amber mixed in, say, 10 to 30% amber. Mm -hmm. Harvest too early when they're mostly clear and you haven't reached peak cannabinoid development. Harvest too late when they're mostly amber, and the effect might be more sedative as THC degrades. Mostly cloudy, some amber, got it. So you cut them down, then comes drying, right? Why is that so important? Drying is essential for preserving those volatile terpenes, the compounds responsible for flavor and aroma, and for preventing a harsh smoke. You need to dry them slowly. What's the ideal drying environment? The sources consistently recommend a dark room, kept cool and moderately humid. Aim for around 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and about 45 to 55% humidity. Hang the branches or lay them on racks, ensuring good air circulation around them, not blowing directly on them. This usually takes about seven to 14 days. Rushing the dry makes the final product harsh. Okay, slow dry. And then comes the step that apparently separates the good from the great, curing. Ah, the cure. This is the transformative step. It's what turns decent dried buds into truly premium flour. It's not just storage, it's an active process. How does it work? Once the buds feel dry on the outside but still have a little moisture inside, typically when the smaller stems snap instead of bend, you trim them and put them into airtight glass jars. Don't pack them too tightly. And then just leave them. No, this is key. For the first week or two, you need to burp the jars daily. That just means opening them for 5-15 minutes to release built-up moisture and ethylene gas and let fresh air in. This prevents mold and allows the curing process to happen evenly. After the first couple of weeks, you can burp less often. I How long should curing last? Minimum two to four weeks, according to those sources. But honestly, many connoisseurs cure for months. Using a small hygrometer inside the jars to monitor the humidity, aiming for around 58-62% RH inside the jar, is highly recommended for nailing the cure. And chemically, what's happening during that cure? Why bother? It's pure chemistry in action. Curing allows bacteria and enzymes to break down leftover chlorophyll and other harsh compounds. Chlorophyll is what gives improperly cured bud that nasty, harsh, grassy, or hay-like taste and smell. Ah, okay, so curing gets rid of the bad stuff. Exactly. And at the same time, it allows the delicate terpenes and cannabinoids to fully mature and meld, developing complex flavors and aromas. It results in a smoother, tastier, and often perceived as more potent experience. Skipping the cure or rushing it. That's the difference between ditch weed and top shelf flour. Our sources are clear, it's non-negotiable for high quality. So bringing this all together, connecting it back to the biology we started with, what's the big takeaway for the home grower trying to produce amazing THDA flour? I think the core lesson is that the plant operates as a complete system. Every single input, light, water, nutrients, air, temperature, humidity, directly affects the final chemical output, the cannabinoids and terpenes. Any significant environmental stress, it just tanks that quality potential. Premium production is all about working with the plant's biology by providing constant, stable comfort throughout its entire life cycle. So for someone learning this, growing cannabis really teaches you systemic thinking, doesn't it? You're juggling light cycles, nutrient schedules, climate control, root health, all interconnected. Absolutely. The growers who get multiple successful harvests, they learn by doing yes, but also by paying attention, making mistakes, learning from them, and figuring out the art of cultivation that goes alongside the science. It's about observing and responding to the plant's needs. It's quite a journey. Now, if you want to skip that steep learning curve, at least for now, and access the benefits of professionally grown material cultivated with this level of care, remember you can explore a selection of high-quality cannabinoids. Find guides and products over at biowellnessx.com. So maybe the final thought for you listening is, Considering all these interconnected biological factors, what specific aspect of the plant's precise environmental needs or life cycle stages will you focus on mastering in your next learning project, whether it's growing or just understanding? Thanks for listening to Voices of Bio Wellness X with Daniel and Sophie.